So what we're going to do now is look at the causes of shock and as we do this it'll give us a classification for describing shock that may arise in our patients. And the first one is probably the most common one we come across in clinical practice and it's hypovolemic shock. And if we look at the word, hypo means low, vol means volume, and emia, of course, is in the blood. Hypovolemic shock. And this will happen any time the volume of the blood is too low. If the volume of the blood is low, that's going to reduce venous return, less blood going back to the heart. If there's less blood going back to the heart, less blood will be pumped out from the heart. The heart obviously cannot pump out blood, it has not received back first. So the hypovolemia will cause a reduced venous return and the reduced venous return will reduce cardiac output. But there's different causes of hypovolemia and the first one we notice here is hemorrhage. This is sometimes called hemorrhagic shock but actually it's a subdivision of hypovolemic shock. The patient ends up with low blood volumes. And this can occur for several reasons. The most common ways to classify hemorrhage is external or internal. So external hemorrhage would be hemorrhage that you see. The blood is going to leak out from a wound and be visible on the surface of the patient's body. And usually you can see how much blood the patient is losing. But it's always important to get a history as well because the patient may have lost a lot of blood before they arrive in your care. So it's always worth saying to the paramedics, was it a bit of a bloodbath at the road traffic accident? And they might say, yes, there was lots of blood, or no, there was very little blood. So you can kind of start getting a picture in your head of how much blood the patient's actually lost. So external hemorrhage can be assessed visually, usually. But of course, hemorrhage can also be internal. It's possible to bleed into body cavities. Now, in various places in the body, there are potential spaces, for example, in the peritoneal cavity or the, the pleural cavity, and blood can leak into these potential spaces. And of course, blood can also um, be lost through long bone fractures. There's a saying, on the floor and four more, that's where blood can go, onto the floor or four more places. That is, the, into the thoracic cavity, into the abdominal cavity, into the pelvic cavity, especially if the patient's got a fractured pelvis, you can bleed torrentially from a fractured pelvis. And the fourth is in the limbs, often due to fractures of the long bones. Remember, huge amounts of blood, a litre or more of blood, maybe up to a litre and a half of blood, can be lost through a fractured femur. 750 mils of blood can be lost through a fractured tibia. So think about where this blood might be going. It could be on the floor, or four more places, on the floor or four more. Sometimes, not common, but you can also become um, hypovolemic as a result of blood loss from um, viral hemorrhagic fevers. Dengue is a possibility, or even something like Ebola. Viral hemorrhagic fevers, also worth bearing in mind if you live in that part of the world. Next cause of hypovolemia we're going to look at are, are burns. Now, burns can be caused by anything hot, obviously, steam, water, hot objects. But in this classification, we could also include things that are very cold, because we do talk about cold burns. And this damages the surface of the skin. And if the surface of the skin is damaged, it's no longer waterproof. And a lot of water can evaporate from the tissue fluids in the body out to the external environment just because of the loss of the waterproof integument. And as well as that, burn injuries cause huge amounts of inflammation. So when someone gets a burn, there is a profound inflammatory response in that area. And of course, when there's inflammation, the small blood vessels, especially the capillaries, are going to dilate as part of that inflammatory response. Because the capillaries are dilated, they are more permeable to water and plasma, and fluids will be lost, will be exuded from. There will be exudates of plasma from the capillaries, that is from the intravascular compartment, into the tissue spaces. There'll be a lot of inflammatory exudate, 
And of course, this is all fluid that is, is um, lost from the blood. And it's useful when someone comes in to be able to quickly assess how much of the body surface area has been lost in a burn. And you can do this quickly with what's called the rule of nine. And we say that an arm is 9% of the body surface area, that the head is 9% of the body surface area, that the front of the torso is 18%, that is 9% and 9%. And Again, the back and the buttocks, we say, is 18%. So again, half of that area would be 9%. And we also say that a leg is 18%. So if the front of it, or the front of one leg is burnt, that would be 9%. Or if all the back of a leg is burnt, that would also be 9%. And we also normally say that the groin is responsible for 1% for of body surface area. So a lot of fluid can be lost from, from burns. Next, dehydration. Now dehydration just means there's an excessive loss of water from the body and it's got many possible causes. The most obvious one is that someone just doesn't drink for a period of time. They might have been walking through a desert and not been able to gain access to water. That can cause dehydration. But more commonly in the clinical environment we see it as a result of diarrhoea and vomiting. So diarrhoea there's an inflammation in the colon, large amounts of fluid can be lost. Again, vomiting, especially repeated vomiting, large amounts of fluid can be lost. And of course, whenever we're talking about losing fluids in this way, as well as talking about fluids, we also need to think about electrolytes. So typically with diarrhea and vomiting, large amounts of potassium can also be lost, making the patient hypokalemic. Diarrhea and vomiting, particularly a problem in children. Diarrhea and vomiting, tragically, is still one of the leading causes of death, and perhaps the leading cause of death, in the world in children under the age of five, because they have a relatively small blood volume, and if they have gastroenteritis causing diarrhea and vomiting, they can become dehydrated relatively quickly, <clears throat> and they can develop hypovolemia, which of course is a life-threatening condition. But there's also medical causes of dehydration. For example, in, in badly managed diabetes, the blood sugar levels will rise. And if the blood sugar level rises above about 11 millimoles, that exceeds what is called the renal threshold. And that, that means that glucose is going to be left within the nephrons. And if glucose is left within the nephrons, that glucose is going to attract a lot of water because glucose is an osmotic molecule. And if the water is attracted and retained within the nephrons, that will pass out and form the urine. And in fact, we call this an osmotic diuresis. <clears throat> so that's quite a common finding in, in diabetes, that there is glucose urea and a diuresis, large amounts of sugary urine as a result of the osmotic diuresis, leading again to potential uh, life-threatening hypovolemia as a result of the dehydration. Now, edema is the collecting of fluids in the tissue spaces, and this can cause hypovolemia as well, and it's common after trauma, especially if there's multiple injuries. So again, if there's injuries to a large area of the body, that's going to cause an inflammatory response, that's going to dilate the capillaries, that's going to increase the amount of inflammatory exudate. And again, quite large amounts of fluid can be lost from the blood as a result of this. Now, the last classification I've got here is third spacing. What do we mean by third spacing? Well, in this context, the first space is where water is retained inside the cells of the body. That would be the intracellular fluid. But there's also fluid outside the cells, that is the extracellular fluid. And the extracellular fluid can be divided into the blood and the tissue and the tissue fluid. Blood, blood is the intravascular fluid and the interstitial fluid is the fluid in between the tissue cells and the capillaries. So intracellular fluid and extracellular fluid are the first two classifications. And in this context, fluid can also collect in third spaces, a third tissue compartment. And these are normally potential spaces within the body. 
So fluid could collect in the pleural membranes, between the pleural membranes, causing a hydrothorax. That can occur in some malignant conditions, for example. Or fluid could collect, collect in the peritoneal cavity. For example, if someone has peritonitis and there is gross inflammation of the peritoneal membranes, that can lead to a lot of fluid collecting within the peritoneal sac. Or if someone has a gastrointestinal obstruction, the fluids can't get through the gastrointestinal tract and there's going to be a lot of fluids collecting above the obstruction within the lumen of the, within the, lumen of the gut, within the lumen of the GI tract. And again, if several litres of fluid are inside the GI tract, that is fluid that is not available for circulation in the intravascular compartment. Therefore, the volume of the blood will drop. The patient will be hypovolemic as a complication. Now, the next classification of shock or cause of shock is cardiogenic. Cardio heart-genic beginning. So cardiogenic shock is a shock which begins with the heart. There is some problem with the heart. You could call this pump failure shock. The heart's supposed to be contracting, pumping out the blood, generating the blood pressure, but this is done inadequately. Pump failure. <clears throat> and one reason this can occur is myocardial infarction. So if there is a coronary arterial thrombosis blocking off the blood supply to an area of myocardium, an area of myocardium will die. That will cause a myocardial infarction. And if sufficient of the heart muscle dies, there's going to be a reduced amount of contractile muscle left and the blood pressure will not be generated as a result of left ventricular contraction because, of course, the dead muscle will not contract. So myocardial infarction, one possible cause of cardiogenic shock. And normally, of course, as blood goes through the, <coughs> as blood goes through the heart, the valves prevent reflux of blood. So we have the atrioventricular valves between the atria and the ventricles, and we have the aortic, the aortic and the pulmonary valve between the ventricles and the, the large arteries. So the valve between the left atrium and the left ventricle is the mitral valve. The valve between the right atrium and the right ventricle is the tricuspid valve. The valve between the left ventricle and the aorta is the aortic valve. And the valve between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery is the pulmonary valve. And if any of these valves cease to function, the, the blood will no longer be channeled through the heart unidirectionally. There will be reflux or regurgitation of blood. And if there's a massive valvular failure, that can cause a very acute cardiogenic shock. So valve function, absolutely essential. Something goes wrong with the valves as a complication of valvular disease. Cardiogenic shock can ensue. Now, dysrhythmia means any abnormal rhythm of the cardiac contraction. So normally, of course, there should be a sinus rhythm with a P, Q, R, S, T in the right order, and that should be fairly regular. If the rate is between 60 and 100, we describe that as a sinus rhythm. So normally there should be a P, Q, R, S, T in the right order, and it's regular. But if there's a disturbance in the rhythm of the heart, then the heart may not pump as efficiently as it should do. In atrial fibrillation, for example, the atria can just flutter and fibrillate and not contract effectively as they should do. They just flutter atrial, well, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter actually is something slightly different. But in atrial fibrillation, the, the atrial muscle just fibrillates. You don't get the normal atrial contraction. And this reduces the pumping efficiency of the heart to some extent. But if there's disruption in the ventricular myocardium, for example, if there's a ventricular tachycardia, where the ventricles are contracting very quickly, or there's a ventricular fibrillation, 
Well, if there's a ventric ventricular fibrillation, what will the patient's blood pressure be when they have ventricular fibrillation? Well, it's going to be essentially zero, isn't it? It's a cardiac arrest situation. So dysrhythmias can lead to acute cardiogenic shock. <clears throat> Cardiomyopathy refers to any disease of the heart muscle itself. This can occur relatively acutely as a result of some viral infections, viral myocarditis can damage the myocardium, or it can occur as a more chronic process in alcoholism, for example. And cardiac failure is a coverall term that means exactly what it says. Um, the heart starts to fail. <clears throat> in cardiac failure, the cardiac output is insufficient to meet the metabolic demands of the body's tissues. And this can occur as the end result of a wide variety of cardiac conditions. So in heart failure, in the terminal stages, the patient will become hypotensive, and it's quite reasonable to classify that as a form of cardiogenic shock. So hypovolemia, cardiogenic, the next one I want to look at is called obstructive shock, and other cause of shock, obstructive shock. And there are several causes here we can consider. One is obstruction within the veins. So if someone suffers a deep venous thrombosis, <clears throat> that blood clot can break off as an emboli. It will come up the veins of the leg, it will go through the inferior vena cava, through the right side of the heart, and be pumped out into the lungs. <clears throat> now, when the clot is going up through the legs, it's going into progressively larger vessels, so the emboli, the blood clot, can flow freely with the natural venous return. And again, when it goes through the heart, it's going through fairly large chambers. But then, when it's gone through the right ventricle, into the pulmonary artery, then the lumen starts getting smaller. The pulmonary trunk will divide into the right and the left pulmonary branches. And the emboli will lodge whenever it can no longer fit through the pulmonary vessels. So a massive pulmonary emboli could lodge in the main pulmonary trunk. A slightly smaller one might lodge in a very large pulmonary artery. Smaller ones will lodge in, in smaller arteries. But if there's an obstruction of the blood as it passes through the lungs, then that means that the blood cannot return to the left side of the heart as it normally would. So the blood will not be returning from the heart, from the lung, sorry, to the left side of the heart. And of course, the blood that returns to the left side of the heart goes through the left atrium through the left ventricle and is ejected out of the aorta into the systemic circulation. So if the blood can't get through the lungs, the blood can't return in the pulmonary veins, therefore the amount of blood going to the left side of the heart is reduced, therefore cardiac output will also be reduced. It's an obstruction of the circulation. If it's severe, that the patient will be admitted given that this occurs outside of hospital, with very low blood pressure, perhaps unrecordable blood pressure. It's an obstructive shock. Now, another cause is, is, is compression of the heart itself. Tamponade means compression of an organ. And tamponade can occur, most commonly it occurs as a result of penetrating thoracic trauma. So in an injured patient, it's always worth considering. Now, if there's injury to the heart or the pericardium, like any other organ, it can bleed. And the pericardial sac is a rigid, fibrous sac that protects the heart beneath. But if there's bleeding into the pericardial sac, the pericardial sac <coughs> can only expand a certain amount. And once it's, once it's expanded a certain amount, it'll stop. That means any increased bleeding is going to press the heart and compress the heart inside. And that means the venous return can no longer enter the heart because the heart is compressed. If the venous return 
cannot enter the heart, the heart has nothing to pump out, and again, as a result of that, there would be an obstructive shock. I suppose we could have included that as in the cardiogenic type, really, but we've included it in the, constru in the, in the obstructive shock because there is, is compression. There's an obstruction of the circulatory system. And I think the last one we'll do in the obstructive shock is pressure on large vessels. Now, this can occur if there's a tension pneumothorax. And again, this is most commonly uh, seen after trauma. If a patient has a chest injury, then air can get in and out of the wall of the chest. But sometimes, quite commonly actually, there can be a flap of tissue. And this acts as a valve, letting air into the chest, but not letting air out of the chest. This means that there is a pneumothorax, because there's air in the pleural cavity, but it's a tension pneumothorax because there is a pressure, a pressure builds up. That will cause complete collapse of the lung that's affected. It will tend to push the trachea across actually as well, we tend to get tracheal deviation. But of course the large blood vessels, the inferior and superior vena cava, particularly the inferior vena cava, are going through the chest. And if there's a tension effect here, that will push on these large blood vessels, causing a kink. There'll be, there'll be a shifting of the heart in the large blood vessels. And that will cause a kink in the large blood vessels because of the pressure. And that kink means that the blood cannot return to the heart as normal. So again, there's an obstruction in the circulatory system because there is obstruction as a result of external pressure on the large blood vessels. So that's the first three types of shock we've considered. Hypovolemic, cardiogenic and obstructive shock. Now the next three classifications of shock I want to talk about are sometimes described as distributive shock and we want to look at those next.